so the Arathi, what we know. So there's loads of great lore uh, regarding the Arathi in the Alpha, but here's some of my favorite stuff. They were teleported to the cavern where they are right now, to Hallowfall, 15 years ago. They were on their way to fight the final battle. They'd been sent from their empire. So there's an empire across the sea. Let's put this first, okay? There's an empire. <laughs> A Rathi empire beyond the western storms. We know that they uh, split off from the Arathi Empire, probably at its collapse uh, 1,200 years ago in in-game lore, and they have an entire empire across the sea, beyond the storms. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that the storms weren't there when they first set off across the sea to found the empire? Or does it mean they found a way through the storms? Or does it mean they were teleported beyond the storms to start their empire? We don't know. But we know that there is a whole empire there. A vast Arathi empire. We don't know anything about any baddies or well, baddies, any uh, kind of opposing forces to the empire across there. And that place, right, it's got to be, it's got to be Avaloran, right? That's got to be Avaloran, surely. That's, that's got to be what it is. It's got to be where they are. I would have thought. We know that there is an emperor there. We don't know who the emperor is. We don't know if there are, have been many, many different emperors in the last 1200 years. We don't know if there's only been one emperor. If the emperor is an elf or a half elf, it's quite uh, feasible that it has been just the one empire the entire time. Uh, the one emperor. You know, and we don't know what that emperor is like. We know that he commands a fanatical following amongst his people. And we know his people are very nice. We know the people down in uh, Hallowfall are really generally quite cool and quite friendly and quite helpful, apart from the ones that have turned into baddies. <laughs> but as Anduin says in the questing, he says, you know, like, these guys are really nice, but I don't know about this. We don't, we don't know anything about the emperor. I wonder if he's someone we need to worry about. Anduin's exact words in the questing. Pretty interesting. So we know that the Emperor sent them across uh, the sea on their way to fight the final battle. And they were on their way through the Western Storms to get to the other side, i.e. to get to our part of the planet. And that's when they were teleported. They were in the middle of the storms when they were teleported into Hallowfall. Very, uh, lots of incredibly interesting things we can think about here. What is the final battle is the, the most uh, interesting thing for me. So here's the question. When was 15 years ago in WoW terms? When was it? Generally, every expansion is said to be a year. Which is stupid, by the way. It's one of the most stupid fucking rules they ever came up with in WoW lore. Fucking incredibly stupid. WoW expansions last two years. Why not just do it all in real time? Why not just say two year an expansion is two years? Why not just do that? It makes it so much fucking easier. One of the great things about MMOs is that it happens in real time. Why have this fucking thing where you have an expansion that lasts two years and then go, oh, did you enjoy that one year of Azeroth? And you know what that means, right? You know what that means? That means fucking there are two winter veils every year. There are two winters on Azeroth every year because of this stupid fucking rule. There are two fucking noble gardens on Azeroth every year because of this stupid fucking rule. They're like, happy Winter Vale, everyone. See everyone for the next bit of Winter Vale, which is this year as well. <laughs> like, it's so fucking stupid. What do you mean so? What do you mean so? It's ridiculous. It's stupid. I hate it. It's so stupid. 
<laughs> is Tally having his Joker moment? Yes! I just think it's so stupid. I think it's so stupid. There are two Noble Gardens and two Winter Vales and two everything else that is obviously an annual event every year in Azeroth simply because they were like, oh yeah, you know an expansion lasts one year in real time. Why? Just say it's two years! Anyway, so generally, a WoW expansion is accepted to be one year in WoW time. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, right? I think they've actually changed that in recent years and that they're generally saying that a WoW expansion is two years now. I think they've kind of done it now. Uh, that, yeah, yeah, they, they now say that uh, an expansion is two in-game years. And do you know what that means? It means that canonically... In Azeroth, there used to be two Winter Veils a year, and now there's only one! Azeroth, it used to be like they've cancelled one of their Christmases! They used to have two Winter Veils a year, and now they only have fucking one! It means the people used to have two birthdays a year because there were two marches, and now they only have one! What the fuck is going on on Azeroth? But, but, at least they did it right. At least they've done it right now. No, at least, you know, okay. It, do, do we know when they changed it to once every two years? Do we know when they changed it to once every two years? Because I, I know it is supposed to be that now. Um, but wh when was that? BFA. Okay, so, let's work this out. We had a three-year time jump. We had uh, Dragonflight. Dragonflight is now over, which was two years. We had two years Shadowlands. <sighs> we had two years BFA. Legion was one year. Well, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. One year Legion. One year wad. That's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. One year mists. One year cata. Uh, don't forget the seven year time skip after Shadowlands. No, it was a three year time skip. <laughs> it was. A, it's officially a, a three years time skip from the end of from the end of Shadowlands. The Shadowlands lasted two years, then there was a three-year time skip, then there was two years of Dragonflight. So, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen. Oh my god, we're going back further than I thought here, actually. One year Wrath, one year TBC. TBC. Oh, I sent you an official Steve Denuza timeline via, D, uh, via DM. Okay, okay, that's that's good. And, and that way we can blame Denuza, right? <laughs> that way we can just blame him. Okay, okay. Is is this it? Is this correct? Is it realistic to say... Well, this is a, a question. I took a guess with Anduin's age in Mop, which I guessed at 15. Where Where's the official one? Okay, Blizz has already told us canonically, at least until they reckon it, how long expansions and the time between them is, taken from Wowhead after a forum post by Steve Denuza. Okay. So... 15 years ago. Right, so we're on 42 years right now, okay? Which means 15 years ago from 42 was uh, 37? 30, no, 27, 27. So we're looking at 27, which is uh, Wrath of the Lich King. The end of Burning Crusade from... from Burning Crusade into into Wrath of the Lich King, basically. We're looking at we're looking at the changeover between expansions there, pretty much, uh, which is what I worked out. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Okay, good. So we're looking at somewhere towards the end of TBC and the beginning of Wrath of the Lich King. That's when they were sent to fight their final battle, which suggests that they were going to fight the Lich King. Or, you know, I mean, that's why they were heading. I also love the way that whatever it was, they thought they were joining in the final fight. We we beat it. <laughs> Without them. It's like, okay, fuck you. Um, they do mention it's the final battle between light and shadow. Yeah, and here's the thing, right? 
we can work out that that's when they set sail. But if the Emperor has any kind of um, foresight, any kind of, you know, psychic sight, then even if they end up fighting something 20 years from now, you would say, oh, well, the Emperor made them leave at the right time because they got there for that fight. You know, just it, it's not when they leave, it's when they get there. If the Emperor's got any kind of, you know, timey-wimey foresight, right? So they left at the end of TBC, beginning of Wrath of the Lich King, but that doesn't mean they were coming to fight the Lich King. You would argue that, you know, like, like a good wizard, they always arrive exactly when they're supposed to, and that actually the fight that they were supposed to take part in is upcoming and, and is on its way. If, you know, assuming that maybe this was all supposed to happen, right? So, yeah, I mean, you have to assume that whatever it is, the final fight between light and dark, if it is even a thing, here's the thing, the Emperor could be sh full of shit. The Emperor could easily be full of shit, in which case, doesn't really fucking matter. But if he's not full of shit, if they are not full of shit, then you could argue that it's like, I know that in 50 years time, the final fight between light, light and dark is going to happen. I know that to defeat light, uh, darkness, I have to send all our best fighters in a big ship right now. And I know what's going to happen to them. They're going to get teleported by some weird force. Most of them are going to die. And the ones that are left over generationally in 50 years going to turn into such a badass bunch they're going to team up with like the champion of azeroth and anduin and people like that and you know this is what needs to happen to ensure that we win the final fight of light that could absolutely be it of course it could uh, but it is still interesting to work out when they actually left and it, it was towards the end of tbc uh towards the beginning of wrath of the lich king but they're here now uh which is great i have more questions <laughs> <laughs> what teleported them? What teleported them? What was it? Uh, you're assuming the teleporting didn't involve some sort of time travel or time dilation. Exactly. Exactly. What teleported them? Now, it's easy to assume, isn't it, that the crystal is what teleported them? Definitely. Of course it is. And the crystal's been there, all light and shiny. The first thing that happened when they teleported there was a whole bunch of Nerubians attacked them. And they've been just fighting for survival the rest of the time. The whole time they've been fighting for survival. Very nice. Good for them that in that time, they've also managed to build one of the fucking most beautiful cities in the whole of WoW. One of the most beautiful cities on the whole of Azeroth. Like, they literally built this shit in their spare time whilst fighting for their lives. It's like, oh my god, life is so hard down here. It's just a constant battle for uh, survival, you know? It's one thing after another. Our backs are up against the wall the whole time. There, there's nothing to do. No one's got anything to eat. We're just fighting the whole time. As soon as people are ready, we enlist them in the fight. We put a weapon in their hand. We push them out to the front rows, the front lines. People are dying all the time. we got to get out there and we got to fight. We were teleported here with nothing. And in their spare fucking time, they built this place they built this if this existed anywhere else in the world this would be one of the fucking eight wonders of the world just this fucking monastery here it's incredible they built it in their spare time in 15 years <laughs> this entire city i mean it's stunning now of course you know it was an armada it was a traveling expeditionary force. So you'd have to assume that they didn't just have soldiers aboard, but they had things like stonemasons, things like architects, because they were traveling to the other side of the world. You'd have thought they always planned to kind of set up a base there, right? You'd have thought they had always kind of, you know, they had people with the expertise. They had people with the tools to kind of like build and make things. This town is amazing, by the way. Uh, this zone is, it's literally one of the best zones in, in the entire history of WoW. I know you're probably sick of hearing it because everyone's been saying it, but I swear to God, this city, uh, everything about it, right, is brilliant. Like the story, the lore implications, the characters, the whole general vibe of it is fucking incredible. 
Not to be that guy, but wouldn't these people be spectacularly inbred by now? They've been here for 15 years, which means they've, they've been here one generation, which means most people who were here were not born here. And unless they were spectacularly inbred to, in the first place, uh, no. <laughs> like, if you go on a, if you joined the army and they sent an armada of you and the whole armada got shipwrecked somewhere and, you know, one generation later, you wouldn't be inbred, would you? Like, the, the people that were born here are, are literally just the kids that are in the uh, the orphanage, pretty much. Anyone under the age of 15. Um, so, you know, it, you'd imagine it'd be quite easy for them to avoid inbreeding for a few generations, at least. Are those runes on the crystal? Yeah, this is a Naru. There's no two ways about it. It's one of the biggest fucking Narus we've ever seen, but it is huge. Um, I haven't seen any comparisons. I'm sure they'd exist, and I, I would imagine that these... Symbols probably match up with like the symbols in the ground and stuff like that. I, I, I'm guessing that's probably the case, right? Keep Illidan the fuck away from this crystal. That's what we're saying, right? Keep Illidan the fuck away. Anyway, so that's what we know about uh, the Arathi. So I, I think, you know, they've, they've clearly done an extraordinary job to build this shit in 15 years. Uh, but, um, you know, survival is a great motivator. Uh, so I, I buy it. I buy that they've managed to build all this in 15 years. Still, it's still pretty spectacular. Fair play. Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, here we go. Now, there is one wonderful thing in the lore, and this is a spoiler for the story. We know that this crystal changes its cycles, just like a Naru, between light and shadow. However, it hasn't always done that. When the Arathi first arrived, it was just light all of the time. Do you know when it started cycling? Because we do. They talk about it with Anduin, and Anduin works it out. It's the big stab. The first time this crystal changed to void was when Sargeras stabbed the world. So this isn't the end of Sargeras' sword. Like, I think, I mean, I did. I thought it was when I first saw it in the uh, presentation, whatever. And, and Blizz did put an end to that quite quickly. They, they clarified that very quickly. So we have no idea how long this has been here, but we know it started changing and started cycling to this void loop when Sargeras stabbed the world. And my question is, why? Why did that happen? Why? 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 Why, though? But why? And if it's not a Naru, yeah, maybe it is Azeroth itself. Who knows? They say that the Ember Shards uh, that kind of are about this place, that they use to power everything. Uh, Anduin says it's not Azeroth, but it pretty much... It's not Azerite, but it pretty much is. So the crystal is now pregnant and has hormone burst. <laughs> is it a source of their light or do they have a different source? Uh, generally, this is the source of their light, yeah. Fell cracks the armor, letting void seep in. Could be. That seems the most likely thing, right? And it does kind of, it makes you think, you know, was it this that Sargeras was aiming for? His sword landed in Silithus, right? Which is here. Here. <laughs> here. Here's Silithus. Okay. And here. And here is Hallowfall. Here's the crystal right here in the sea between Pandaria and Kalimdor. So, you know, it's not super, you know, it's not right on top of, but it's not a million miles away. You could make a feasible argument that he was aiming for this. Dude has terrible aim. Do not forget that at the time he was being sucked off of Azeroth by the Titans, back to be held prisoner in the Pantheon. You know, it's not like he was able to, like, stay still, take his aim, and take his time and do whatever he wanted. At the time, he was being sucked off of Azeroth by the Titans and, and back to prison. That's what you've got to remember. And you might think it's very easy to keep your concentration and have terrific aim when you're being sucked off of a planet, 
by Titans. But, you know, I would imagine that it's actually very, very hard to concentrate on getting a sword in the right place, you know, in, in just seconds, basically. He did not have long to aim this thing. And when you're getting sucked off that hard from the planet, when you're getting sucked off that hard by multiple people off of a planet, it can be very hard to concentrate. It can be very hard to aim your sword. That's all I'm saying. You know, you don't always have... When you're getting sucked off that hard by that many people off of, off of the planet, then you're not always completely in control of, you know... <laughs> where, 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 where your weapon goes down. So you could make, a, you could make a, an argument that he was aiming for this crystal. But either way, the fact that the sword went into the ground has affected the crystal and now makes it go through a void uh, light cycle as opposed to just being light all the time. And I would love, love to find, I mean, we're going to find out, right? But I'd love to find out what he was aiming for, why it's had this effect. Did he want the crystal to turn voidy? Did he want to... Because one thing that's definitely happened is, with the crystal turning voidy, it has turned the tide in the battle with the Nerubians. The Nerubians now are gaining a much bigger upper hand because every time it goes voidy, like, the Arathi get absolutely fucked. It's obviously a huge advantage to the Nerubians who are attacking that the uh, crystal goes void. Not just because it turns everything into a void state and they, they are much stronger and the Arathi have a harder time fighting, but because of what it does to the Arathi. The Arathi are losing hope. You know, this huge star, Bellameth, Bellameth, sorry, um, Bellator, which they, they, you know, worship as a god, right? suddenly it's turning against them. Suddenly it's turning all voidy and that makes them lose their hope. And hope is all they've got. This is like a really, really strong part of the narrative in this zone, right? Um, and it means that Zalatath and the Void are starting to make inroads, not just in their physical attacks, but in how they're able to turn members of the Arathi to the Void and, and turn them against the Arathi that, that stay towards the light. Doesn't he hate the void? He destroyed a whole planet because of that. That's what we hear. That's what Chronicle says. And I, I believe it personally. Um, but who knows at this point, honestly? It, it could be argued that maybe he was aiming for the crystal because he knew it would turn voidy and he wanted to destroy it. We get in void paladins, yeah? Well, I've got to say, one of the very, very weird things about playing in this zone is, you know, like a whole part of the narrative, um, halfway through the zone, the, the crystal turns voidy and loads of the story is about, you know, trying to make the, the crystal go light again. And there's all these void creatures attacking everywhere and all these, there's a whole sect of the Arathi that have turned to the void um, and, you know, we're fighting them and it's all void shit happening all over the place. And there's me playing as Shadow Priest and I'm like... It's a bit fucking awkward, isn't it? And they're like, ah, oh, Taliesin, help us, help us. And I'm like, mm, yeah, okay. Void, void, void. And I just feel like they're giving me these fucking stink eyes like, huh, are you sure you're not with them? What's, are you sure this is, um, hmm. Is it safe to watch yet? Why so many spoilers? Because it's really, really interesting WoW lore. And, you know, it's out there. People are playing through it. It's really interesting to talk about. I'm sorry. Like, that. this is the thing, right? Um, these zones, this zone in particular is so good and so chock full of, uh, of, of WoW lore um, beyond even just this expansion, that it's just super interesting to talk about. And yeah, it will still be just as interesting to talk about when the game is out. And in fact, we'll get loads more when the game is out, of course. But, you know, it's, you know, if your job is to make WoW content and talk about WoW, and if you have a, an enthusiast's level interest in the lore of the game, uh, then it's kind of, you, you, people are going to be talking about this, you know?
It is what it is. I've got the red bot spoiler up. I, I completely understand if people don't want to watch. It is mostly speculating anyway. Of course it is, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we can't not talk about this stuff, right? But it is all speculation, you're right. Uh, by the way, Tally, I've seen this in your latest video. What's the evidence of the Arathi Empire beyond the storms? I know about the Arathi Highlands uh, beginning in Troll Wars. So uh, just the fact that we don't know about it. We know that they were flying through storms to get uh, to the final fight, right? And that they were traveling. Um, so, I mean, I guess it's possible that they are this side of the storms, the Arathi Empire. I would... I would be very surprised if it turned out that the Arathi Empire, this huge fucking empire that has apparently existed for 1200 years, was on this side of the storms. I, like, um, it seems to me very, very likely that the uh, the empire in question is on the other side of the storms. WoW have been setting up uh, the Western storms and the fact that there are things beyond the Western storms, you know, properly with a clear intention of, of putting stuff there and having the player go there uh, all the way through Dragonflight. All the way through Dragonflight. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's quite clear that they are planning on taking players there at some point. And this would seem to be one of the things that we would expect to find there. Is this this Arathi Empire. This half-elven Arathi Empire. Which is so cool. It's so cool. It's like... Very cool. Avaloran is not going to be a good place. I think you're probably right. <laughs> Maybe they're saving it for after the saga. Maybe they're planning on using it as part of the saga. Don't forget that Midnight... A very interesting thing. Let's let's think about, you know, when we might see this. Midnight. How does this link into Midnight? Oh, thank God, we're back on topic. Well, we know that Midnight is setting uh, Kel'Thalas... We know from the short story that came out yesterday, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but there's a heavy, heavy emphasis in that short story on the rebuilding of Silvermoon, you know? Everywhere they go in that short story, they talk about how Silvermoon is being rebuilt, how there's works happening everywhere, how parts of Silvermoon, basically untouched and left to rot since the Scourge invasion, are at this point in time being rebuilt. That's clearly in preparation for Midnight and the redesign of Kel'Thalas. I think it's very obvious that Silvermoon is going to be a hub city and it's going to be a neutral hub city which we'll talk about in a little bit. People aren't very happy about it, but I think that seems to be the way it's going. And Chris Metzen described Midnight as being about the reunification of the elfin tribes, right? So that would be the most obvious example of that would be the reunification of the High Elves and the Blood Elves, something that's happening on an unofficial level already in game you know all high elves are welcome to come into silver moon even if their alliance and, and and canonically high elves generally are high elves are welcome into silver moon on pilgrimage to visit the sunwell by order of lothamar that is something they're allowed to do have been since bfa you know that's something that is allowed like alliance are allowed in silver moon right now don't forget that the elves of Kel'Thalas are bound by oath to support the, uh, the, the um, Arathi bloodline. Um, the Lothamar bloodline. A Lothar bloodline, I should say. you'd imagine that's probably going to be something to do with what happens in midnight so you you know they 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 are bound to they're bound in friendship and support to the bloodline of lothamar right that's why lothamar was uh anduin uh sorry lothar sorry oh i'm such a dick that's why anduin lothar was such an important character in the second war and um, how he was able to get like uh people on side and stuff like that as, as supposedly the last true member of the bloodline. Well, it turns out he wasn't the last true member of the bloodline. It turns out there's an entire empire based on that bloodline 
across the sea. Now, what's that going to mean for the elves of Kelthalas in Midnight? Maybe they're leaving the Arathi Empire as something that happens after the World Soul Saga, but you can easily see how they would be relevant before then, right? So it seems likely to me that the Emperor, whoever the Emperor is, he is not a Lothar, or they are not a Lothar, simply because uh, when we talk to Farin, who is this beautiful, lovely character who we all love, if we're not racist. And, you know, you're not racist if you don't like this character. Of course you're not. There are any number of reasons you might not like this character. Maybe you just don't like the sound of her voice or something like that. And that's perfectly reasonable. But if you, if you don't like her because, you know, you think she's box ticking or pandering or something like that, then you're fucking racist. Yeah, definitely. 100%. So here is uh, Feyrin Lothar, right? Now, when she talks about herself, and we have many uh, stay a while and listen, actually, the stay a while and listen in this zone are absolutely incredible. Like some really, really good stay a while and listens between uh, Feyrin and Anduin. This is like the zone that is being used, and, and Anduin's relationship with, with Feyrin and their interactions are clearly what's being used to kickstart Anduin kind of, you know, rediscovering his light and coming back and forgiving himself and things like that. They have some very deep conversations about it. It's actually really, really good. Um, how the fuck is she holding that shield? It is attached to her um, to her pauldron. It's attached to her shoulder pauldron. At last, huge wow pauldrons actually having a use and purpose. I like it. Um, and she says that her family uh, used to be noble, but it isn't anymore. So she does seem to be as close to like a direct descendant of Anduin Lothar as 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 we can get in the Arathi. But it, what it means is, if she's from a family that used to be noble but isn't anymore, that does kind of suggest that the Emperor, whoever the Emperor might be, is not a Lothar. That the Emperor is someone else. But there is a member of the Lothar bloodline who lives and who is part of the Arathi Empire, even though they haven't, you know, they, they've never really been a proper part of the, um, oh, she is voice acted and she sounds great. Yeah. Oh, sound effects enabled. Here we go. That should do it. My faith kindles my hope. When shadow falls, lamplighters rise. I will see you through the shadow. A lamplighter brings hope. We cannot hide from evil. I could be playing Light's Gambit now. We owe our service to those in need. We are a light in the darkness. She sounds South African. Not when to shadow me, but maybe falls, she is. Yeah, maybe. Lamplighters rise. Yeah, my very Diablo vibes, honestly. Yeah, so, my um, hope. so there we are. That's her. And um, that's what she sounds like. Uh, generally, the Arathi sound kind of English in general. Uh, there's uh, there's more implications to this as well. So whoever she is, she you know her family are not the emperor. Whoever the emperor is, they're not of the Lothar line. But back to the conversation here. Oh, okay. And so the reason that she is blind and only has one arm and has all these scars is from the crash when they were first teleported. When the Arathi were first teleported here, they crashed into the fucking rock. Like, they were going through the storms, and uh, they just got teleported uh, randomly by this radiant light, okay? And uh, she was stowed away. She wasn't supposed to be on the mission. She was but a child. Now, we don't know how old that is. I'm guessing probably around six or seven, because uh, she was old enough to have, you know, like, the wherewithal to stow away on a ship. But she wasn't supposed to be there, um, and uh, she, you know, she was incredibly injured in the crash. Uh, and and that's what these injuries are from the crash. So she's grown up uh, disabled. It's not something that's happened recently or anything like that. If we expect, if we speculate that the emperor is immortal, I don't know why he would be. Well, I mean, he could be a high elf uh, and and essentially immortal, right? Uh, you know, in in human terms, even if elves aren't immortal, they kind of basically are because they live so long, right? You know. They they can live they can live like thousands of years, which in human terms they're basically an immortal. Um, and yeah, the I mean the emperor it could have been one guy for the last twelve hundred years, absolutely easily, you know. Um, 
Feyre and Lothar feels like she's, you know, many, many generations separated from uh, whoever the Lothar was that went over and founded uh, the, the, um, the Empire across the sea. Are we getting Warhammer vibes? Yep, yeah, we get Warhammer vibes. We get, um, I tell you what I get from the whole of the War Within so far, honestly. I'm getting big, big Baldur's Gate 3 vibes. And therefore, like, D&D &D, uh, and, and whatever the setting of, of Baldur's Gate in D&D &D terms is. Um, you know, the uh, the ringing depths with the earthen sound uh, feels like the uh, the underdark and uh, zones with the um, uh, forgotten realms. Thank you. Yeah. Big, big forgotten realms uh, vibes here. And and this zone does feel a lot like Last Light Inn and uh, the the Shadowfall zone in uh, Baldur's Gate 3. Very strong, like, Last Light Im vibes, you know? Because you've got the uh, the Harpers all fighting against... Yeah, the Shadow Cursed Lands fighting against the encroaching darkness and having to always be protected against it and stuff like that. And and this zone has huge vibes of that. And there's no way that WoW copied Baldur's Gate 3 on that because they'd have been in production at pretty much the same time. Uh, so it's just, it's just by luck that that's kind of happened. And it's really great. It's really awesome, honestly. And yeah, yeah, uh, and I get big Warhammer vibes, but more Warhammer as opposed to Warhammer 40,000 for sure. Um, and it's great. I love all that shit. So yeah, I'm, I'm down with it. Uh, oh, Last Light Inn is amazing. I love all that shit. <laughs> they had a mole in Larian Studios. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, uh, whoever the Emperor is, probably maybe, maybe, uh, maybe an elf and has been there for ages. Maybe not. Who knows? But the important thing is, in terms of Midnight, as, as we were saying, sorry. In terms of Midnight, it's about the reunification of the elf tribes and the elves of Kel'Thalas, Lothamar included, are bound by oath to help the Lothar bloodline. It seems to me impossible that Feyrin is not going to be involved in the story of Midnight and that she won't be part of bringing together the elven tribes. They have a common link in her. Like, you know, the elves of, of Kel'Thalas. The high elves and the blood elves are all bound to her. <laughs> in, in, in a way, you know? And it seems likely that she will play a part in bringing them all together. That's what it seems like to me anyway. 